will anoint her head with fresh oil and her horn will be exalted like that of the unicorn that she has poured to us this month. The God will also replenish. She will never lack any good thing. Her prayers are answered because she served at the altar. The blessings of the altar will go through all that belongs to her. Her family, her business, her friends, her neighbors would reap from the benefits of being at the altar. Thank you, Father. Now, can we pray for the Sunday school and ask that God speak to us yet once again? There is a boundless reserve in God. Can you say, Lord, I need more, 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 more? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, because we have more. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Lesson 50, page 130. We have a God who never fails. We have a God who never fails. We have a God who never fails. Who never fails. Jesus never fails. Forevermore. Amen. Jesus never fails. Amen. He never fails. Amen. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. He will never fail forevermore. In the book of Revelations, Jesus came to the churches and says, I am the Amen. I am the faithful. I am the true witness. When people want to, we say things at the end. Amen when we pray at the end. When Jesus wants to start a statement, he starts with verily, verily. Meaning, amen, amen. He does not need our amen for his statement to be validated. When we, when people, you know, we wait for the end of his thing for us to agree on it. So that word agree, that amen is an agreement statement. We agree that let it be so. But Jesus, most of his statement, he starts with verily, verily, I say to you. I don't need your agreement. I don't need your, you know, he's the faithful. He's the true witness. He's dependable. His word is sure. And so when we are studying something like this rewards, how to amass for self reward in heaven, you can be sure that he is faithful. It's not like a banking system that there are terms and conditions that are hidden. I don't know if you understand that they tell you on the surface that these goods cost $10. When you're paying, it's $11.99. I don't know if you understand. Especially when I came to the US, it was a major concern for me because I don't understand it. They said it costs this, right? Or you see that they're going to pay you this. And when the money enters your account, something is already gone. <laughs> you know, I was very concerned. I was like, I don't understand, you know. And then every other thing you do, every other thing you do, they still remove something for tax. I understand it's a system. But Jesus would say, verily, verily, I say unto you. You can depend. When he says this, you can, you can, you can put his words to the bank. And so... Last week, we started on the story of the rich young ruler, right? We, we wanted to look at uh, a statement he made. He was a man that I said he was admired because he was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. He achieved wealth and rulership at a very young age. And I said to so many of us, that would be the definition of perfection. We want to achieve a lot at a young age so that we enjoy for the rest of our lives, right? You want to be a ruler, at a young age. You want to be rich at a young age. He had respect from people around him. And I want you to think about this. How easy, do you think it is easy for anyone to walk up to Jesus and just ask him a question? Remember the crowd that follows him, right? Remember Zacchaeus? 
Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. What did he do? He had to run ahead of the crowd and climb the sycamore tree just to see Jesus. The woman with the issue of blood had to press through the crowd. The was blind Bartimaeus had to cry, have mercy on me, thou son of David. But the Bible did not say this rich young ruler struggled. He just came to Jesus. Why? He was known in the community. You could imagine that he was respected. People knew him. Do you understand? It's not easy to just come. The man that was, you know, carried by four people who was suffering from the palsy. What happened? He could not come near to Jesus because of the crowd. They had to tear the roof out. But a certain man would just come and say, um, good teacher, what must I do to enter, to have eternal life? He was someone that was reputable. He was respected. People cleared way for him. You know how, you know, had a convoy, convoy, sa, 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 you know? <laughs> and interesting conversation. Jesus said, you know the, the commandments, keep them. And he asked Jesus, which one? And Jesus said, you know, do not do this, do not do that, do this, do that. He said, all these I have kept from my youth. And then the question he asked after that was the reason why we studied. He said, what do I still lack? He had wealth on earth now. Jesus looked at the sincerity of his heart and said, okay, now you've asked. Let me tell you what you can do to amass wealth in heaven. You already have it all here. But as long as Jesus was concerned, you don't have anything up there. So we don't want to be people that have all here on earth. We have it all here. Like the rich young ruler. Because the person of Christ is different from the principles of Christ. If you engage his principles, you will enjoy the benefits of those principles. Like I said, sowing and reaping is a principle. If you engage in sowing, the earth will work to ensure that you reap. It's a principle. So you don't even have to know Christ to enjoy that principle of Christ. You don't have to. And so a lot of people who are even unbelievers, Muslims, and even those that are atheists, they are very rich. In fact, the richest people in the world are not even Christians. Because of the principle. Okay, so this man has engaged both principles and the laws of Moses. And the benefit of those laws has made him to have a lot. He was rich. He was young. He was a ruler. What more do I still lack? And Jesus said something. Go and sell all you have. And I remember I said that last week. That the Bible clearly states. He gives seed to the sower. Dickiness, right? And bread to the eater. When you have sown. Right? When you have sown seeds. It is only right for you to enjoy the bread from the seeds you've sown. Harvest is a good time. Now, when Jesus now tells you. To go and take those seemingly harvest of yours <laughs> and sell it and give the proceeds to the poor. It's a principle that was, should I say, that started in the book of Ecclesiastes. Cast your bread upon the water. Bread, like I said last week, there is nothing you do to a bread that will make it grow. It's not a seed. Anthony, I know that you're very smart. I know you can research anything out there. Is there anything you can do to a bread that will make it grow? Nothing? Are you sure? Okay, Dickiness will know the answer. Dickiness, is there anything you will do to a bread that will make it grow? Huh? It's, it's, so that's the it, it, and so when it swells up, what will happen? It will scatter. Can you put it back together again? Do you understand? Cast your bread upon the waters and after many days. What is that many days? What is that many days? We've been looking at end time study. How can we make life here on earth interesting and still have something up there? Some of the things God gives to us is so that we can use them to invest in our profit up there. Some of us have means to help others. The Bible says, he that gives to the poor, 
Bible says he lends to the Lord. Hallelujah. I know that a lot of people have bastardized the teaching of giving. People have exploited God's people and siphoned them of their hard-earned money. But that doesn't negate the importance of giving. In fact, the, 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 the presence of a fake currency is the evidence of a real one. If there's no real, there's no need to fake it. So, Jesus was saying that giving is one of the ways to amass for yourself wealth in heaven. And then, in the first condition we looked at last week, forsaking of house, parents, brethren, wife, or children for the kingdom's sake. That these are things that are close to you. These are people that you grew up with. These are things you can call your tradition, your belief system. What, what, what informs your way of life? These are your parents, your siblings, your house, your culture, your culture, your culture. There are cultures that, um, <laughs> there are people, I know, I'm from Igede. I know many people don't know where that is. It's fine. I'm from Benue State. Benue State is in the middle belt of Nigeria. It's just at the heart of Nigeria, next to Abuja. And Benue State has three major uh, tribes. One is called Thieves or TV Thieves. The second is called Idomas. And the third is called Igede. And I'm part of Igede. Now, the Igedes don't marry people from the Thieves. They don't. They believe that the Thieves are slaves. I'm an Igede. I'm telling you the truth. So, back in the day... The thieves will force their wives who are pregnant to go and steal so that the baby can learn how to, to steal. It was a culture that was accepted way back in the day. You know things have happened when God was not in the picture. Also, the thief culture, back in the day, not now anymore, the best way for someone to entertain his friend is to offer his wife to his friend. You, you understand? They used to, it's, it's a thing. The best, the highest entertainment that I can give my, if Anthony comes to visit me, the best way to entertain, like, and Anthony will say, hmm, this guy, you know, is to offer my wife. It was a culture. It was a culture. Oh, and it was also a culture when after a man has married three, four wives, and one of his sons is now like 18, 19. He marries another woman just for that his son. He's married to the woman, but so that the son can learn the ways of a woman through his wife. And so for that reason, for that reason, the eager they say, those people, none of our own people were married into those people. It was a thing that was a thing of contention. So this day, you are now a tongue-talking believer. Who believes that those that are in Christ, <laughs> do you understand? Those that are in Christ, all things have passed away, right? Behold, and you bring a TV girl to your mom and say, Mom, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, <laughs> and God showed me. And they say, Oh, wow, she's so pretty. Where are you from? You say, I'm from Benin. Where? I'm a TV. Eh? In that scenario, the Bible is saying, he who does not forsake his house. Even though it seems legitimate. Do you know the story of Abraham? What he left? The God that Abraham's parents worship is the God of fertility. It was said that because Abraham, who was supposed to inherit the priesthood of his family left that the gods of fertility cost Abraham. There's a reason why in, in, in the New Testament, the Bible, Jesus told a story about a, a Lazarus and the rich man. Huh? That this Lazarus, when he died, the rich man also died. Lazarus went into somewhere called Abraham's bosom. It means Abraham is a landlord even in heaven. He's not just rich. He wasn't just rich on earth. He was rich in heaven because he was willing to forsake his household. Everyone, you could imagine Lot. 
his slave saying, ah, you should not have left the God of fertility. Prior to Abraham, who do you know in Abraham's lineage that knew about God of heaven and earth? But they knew that the God of fertility was real to them. You think people that worship idol, they don't know why they worship idol. There are things they see that makes them believe that this is real. Hallelujah. He that does not forsake his house. He that does not forsake his parents. He that does not forsake his brothers and sisters. Is not really worthy of the kingdom. Is there something in your household? It could be a custom that goes against God. It could be. That is a good avenue for you to show that I am of God. It's a good avenue for you to show that I am of God. Sometimes I used to wonder, why would Jesus do certain things like, Peter was married. Why would he just all of a sudden take Peter? You know, Peter followed him everywhere he went. What about Peter's wife? What about Peter's wife? Remember Peter's mother-in-law was sick? And Jesus came to the house and healed her. And then she served them. And after everything was done, Peter still followed Jesus and left. Why? What was the principle Jesus was trying to teach? Amen. Of course we know that Jesus is a family man. He knows the concept of a family and the importance of a pedigree. The principle is not you looking at your father and saying, the Bible says this, I'm not concerned. No, that's not it. It's anything that goes against God that is in your family, forsake it forsake it that was last week all right i want us to try and finish this today say uh, showing love to enemies doing well and lending without hope of collecting back very important point um the third point is keeping all god's commandments which include honoring your father and your mother when i was reading i was like why did they put honoring your father and your mother as a criteria here you know uh but keeping all of god's commandments Keeping all of God's command. When I was in secondary school in Nigeria, uh, the equivalent of 12th grade here, I remember, no, I was in 10th grade. I remember I had a very, I had a concern. Sir, I wanted to love God and follow God the best way I could. I wanted to, from a young age, I wanted to. My dad would put a TV, a TV station, and the person that would be teaching, his name is Bile Akani, he's a popular teacher in Nigeria. And I didn't understand why the man was not energetic like the pastors I used to know. But we would all sit and listen. And there's something about being in the presence of something real. You, are, you contact something. Anyways, I wanted to love God. But I had a concern. My mind could, when I see a kissing scene in a movie, my mind could play it over and over and over and even undress them. It was a major concern. I knew something was wrong. I couldn't help myself. So what I did, I stopped watching movies. And on the streets, you're going and you see people holding hands and it's reactivated. And you realize that there is no help for you. There's nothing you can do. And so on one day, one day, we were in a small group of people together and someone was teaching and the person said, the Bible says in the book of James chapter 2 verse 10 that if you are faithful in all the law and yet you transgress in one, you are guilty of all the law. I was not happy. What more do you want me to do that I haven't done, oh God? I've stopped watching movies. I refuse to, to my, my dad sells phones. I refuse to collect a phone. I refuse to have social media. I, ref I said, if watching movies could do this, what, if I go to social media, what would become of my life? I refuse to. What more do you want me to do, oh God? And it was there the Lord spoke to me. Because they say, obeying all of God's commandments. Do you know how many commandments there are there? Do you know how many? If he cannot help you, Anthony, if God cannot help you, to keep all the commandments, he will not need your help. If you can do it by your own strength, he will not need to die for you. If you have the ability in yourself apart from God, there was no need for Jesus to come and die. What we need to learn is how to yield to his strength daily. Because 
it is him that walketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure philippians chapter 2 verse 13 he sees through my eyes he touches through my hands i helplessly replicate the life of righteousness because he lives inside of me every day my my daily meditation is that it is him that is at work inside of me suddenly a day came in still that same school two years down the line i was in my bed i was thinking of a scene of immorality i found out that there was nothing anymore in me nothing nothing how you would just suddenly realize that it is gone it is gone god can do it god can do it so Keeping all of God's commandments is indirectly saying, learn to yield more and more to God. The workings of God inside of you. Every day. There's reward for that. You know, I used to say this. God will manage you if all you have to give to him is 30%. He will manage the 30%. He will work with what you've given to him. That does not mean that that is your ultimate. The question is, how can we amass for ourselves wealth in heaven? Learn to yield to God all the time. So distributing to the necessities of the poor and following Christ, we've talked about that, enduring all things, troubles and bond for the sake of God's elect, setting aside every weight and sin and running with patience the race that is set before us. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1, setting aside every weight, every sin, setting aside every weight, every sin. You know, I used to ask myself, what is the difference between a weight and a sin? Anthony, you have a microphone. (laughs) Ah, Okay, sir. Um, Setting aside every weight and sin. I would say perhaps the weight is like a body that, you know, the body is on you. Okay. Anthony, any other, do you have any other opinion? What the weight, setting aside every weight and sin. Is there a difference between what a weight is and what a sin is? Uh, I can say weight is anything that's holding you down. It might not necessarily be sin, but it just might be something that's taking you away from, let's say, whatever focus you have upon God. Perfect. Weight could be anything that's, you know, taking you away from that, that's keeping you from, you know, focusing on God. Perfect. Can you give it to Satalfik? Do you know any example of what a weight could be? Well, a weight could be something button, something that buttons you because you don't have an understanding of it. So it worries you at night, day, every time you go. That's all you ever think of. So you're buttoned by it. So it weighs you down. Okay. Okay. Bro, Sam, quickly. Talking about athletes. Uh, the athletes cannot run faster if there is something preventing him or her. Now, in our case, for example, something like guilt and condemnation can be a weight because we are not going to believe that God has forgiven us and we are not going to experience any peace, neither joy of salvation. So something like that can be a weight. Thank you, sir. Uh, to me, I think sin is something bad that you actively do it and wait is something that is heavy or like for example if you are not doing the work of god and satan satan take take hold of you you will have a weight that will always be dragging you backward so thank you very much yes So a quick example would be if I if you if you used a job, okay. So a weight or a burden would be that all of a sudden your job lo- announced a layoff, and now you're worried if you're going to be laid off. Another example would be you're on the job, and the sin would be that you're you're constantly stealing paper products and things from the job. Um, weights. Technically, just let me use the illustration that um, um, Brother Sam says. As an athlete, if you have a weight on your leg and they ask you to run, Africa, you're wrong. You can't, you can't move. So weight is anything that, that makes you stagnant. It doesn't make you grow. 
um, it becomes a burden that holds you back. And it is not necessarily could not be a sin. And technically, it could be a sin. It could be grudges, unforgiveness. You know, it's it, it broaden. It depends on where you are. So if it all, or let me say, your heart could be a way to you because it, you, it constantly judge you for things that you, you have done in the past. And you cannot just see past the fact that God has forgiven you in as much as you can forgive yourself. So it can become a sin in a way. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yes. The instruction in Hebrews chapter 12 is please lay aside every weight. Because we deal with sin a lot. We know the sin. It's clear. The colors are clear. This is sin. Don't do it. But there are weights that we've carefully carried. There are worries that has become part of us. There are jobs that have taken away all our time for God. You know, there are things we've done. The guilt, it's no longer, the guilt holds us down that we can't even face God and say, God, it is true that you may have done something yesterday. It is true. And you're not proud of it. The fact that you have, you know, something, it pricks your heart that what I did yesterday is wrong. It's a sign that you are healthy. If a knife cuts you, right, and you can see the blood coming out and you don't feel any pain, you should go to the hospital. Something is definitely wrong. Anthony, right? So the pain is a proof that your system is working well. Or, no. High tolerance of pain means there is still pain, but it, it's, not, it's minimal. Maybe you are leprous. You can't feel anything anymore. Do you understand? That the fact that sometimes your heart pricks you when you do something wrong, it's a sign that you are held in God. Instead of, if you are still in Christ... And you can still commit that sin. Is it when you leave Christ that you will stop committing the sin? You know, let it be that everything pushes you closer to God. I know my father in the Lord, Pastor Muyo Areo, he was, he was a smoker. He, was, he did all those things. When he was saved and the gospel came to him, of course, he did not just stop smoking. He said, they told him, even when you are smoking the Indian hen, be confessing that, you know, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You know, I am, do you understand how crazy that sounds? But what he, was he doing? He was making sure that nothing stops him. And you know, a day would come. That is the truth. That all of a sudden, it will be like night and day. Boom, it's gone. Because you refuse to allow, I, I'm saying, that this is for someone here, that that refuse to allow Satan to use anything to push you away from God. Refuse it. Refuse it. Every weight lay it aside. Do you understand? He was smoking <laughs> and was quoting scriptures. I am the righteousness of God. And today, today, he's, he, he can imagine. You, 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 that's the truth. That's the truth. Keep saying it. So looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, uh, faithful unto death, being persecuted for Christ. So rewards for the overcomers. Quickly, the B part. They will eat of the tree of life. They will not partake in the second death. We've talked about this second death, you know, after the millennial reign. They will eat of the hidden manna and have a white stone with a new name written on it. They will have power over nations. They shall be clothed in white raiment. Their names will not be blotted out of the book of life. Jesus will confess them before God the Father and his angels. This is the one that I like the most. Revelation chapter 3 verse 12c. Or verse 5c. He will confess them. Thank you. He will confess. I noticed something. And I know our time is up. When I am, what is his name? Elijah was running from Jezebel. I don't know. I noticed it. I don't know. I, no one's. Elijah was running from Jezebel. He came to a place. He fell asleep. An angel tapped him and gave him food to eat. He ate. And he went back to sleep. The angel tapped him again and gave him food to eat again. He ate again. And then the instruction was that eat, eat again. For the journey ahead of you is too great for you. You would definitely need the strength of the food to go. So after he had eaten the second time, the Bible says he went 40 days, 40 nights without food 
even to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. When he got to Mount Horeb, I don't know if you remember the story. And then he wanted to meet with God, right? There was storm, hey storm. The Bible said the voice of God was not in it. There was these thunders and lightnings and the voice of God was not in it. And then in a still small voice, the voice of God was in and say, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he says, Lord, I have come. I'm the only one left. These people have killed me. And this. And then after he said that, and then the voice said, go and stand there in front. And then he went and stood. And then the Bible said, again, and then the voice of the Lord said again, Elijah, what are you doing here? Two voices of God spoke, what are you doing here? You know what I thought? It's like, it's like a mother who knows the father carrying a child and saying, what do you want? Let me prepare your answer for your father. I know him more than you do. I'm trying to say, the Old Testament, you know, there's so much, we don't have time. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they are clearly in the Old Testament. They are there. The fact that one, the first voice prepared his answer for the second voice tells us something. When I read that scripture, my, something told me that perhaps you've never really spoken to God the Father. Do you understand? Dickiness, perhaps I've never spoken to God the Father. Perhaps the Holy Spirit is speaking. He's still God. But for you to be introduced to the... De- I don't know if you understand. They want to screen and make sure that you don't say what you're not supposed to say. I don't know if you watch these movies about a king. Eh? Where the word of the king is, there is power. That I, Why would Elijah... I don't go and read that place. I think it's somewhere in 2 Kings chapter 18 or so. Why would Elijah be asked, what do you want? And then when he gave his answer, and his answer was, okay, correct. Then he said, go and stand there. And then the voice came again. Now, what do you want? What was that second voice? Was the first voice trying to prepare him for the second? I'm just trying to say, when, when that place says that you will, I will confess you before my father, it, it's an honor. I don't know if you understand. When I read that Stephen was being stoned to death, and the Bible says his eyes were open, he saw that Jesus Christ was standing. I said, I know the, pro- the processes of a kings don't stand. They don't stand. They are the ones that people stand for. When they sit, everyone sits. When they stand, everyone stands. Can you imagine the heavens? Everyone, Abraham, Elijah, Moses, they were all standing because Stephen was coming. How many people did you hear that Stephen healed? Do you understand? We, do, we don't have an account of him healing anyone. But you can imagine the great Elijah was standing when Steve, brother Stephen, the first martyr was walking. Anyways, I, I, I'm just saying that he says, I will introduce your name. This is Moriah. During her time, she made sure that unrighteousness did not prevail. She raised her children out of the harshest of situations. And like Abraham, eh, she made sure that posterity is preserved because she cultivated in them the ways of the Lord. This is Bowman. Out of all the obstacles, he remained true to the call. He endured so many loss. Even though there were so many reasons for him to turn back, he continued. This is him. And you see the angel say, yes, we were rooting for you. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, Hebrews chapter 12, that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness. They are cheering for you. You may not see them, but they are saying, brother Sam, continue. Brother Sam, continue. You may not have the answers to your prayer yet. Brother Sam, continue. Sister Kerry, continue. You may not have all the answers yet, but we know what you don't know. You are closer than you think. Continue. And you are introduced. And, and Paul will say, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh. Wouldn't heaven be a great place? Wouldn't heaven be a great place? Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's pray. Continue. Continue. Jesus says continue. I am coming very soon. And my reward is with me. To give to every man as his deeds require. 
Can you say, Lord, I receive strength to continue. Strength to continue. Strength to continue. That nothing, no matter the tide, how strong it is, would sweep me away from this solid foundation that you have planted me on. Lord, I receive strength to continue. That nothing, nothing will hinder me from being introduced to the angels. Lord, please. Lord, please. Strength to continue. 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 That even when the flesh is weak, Lord, give me strength like Gideon and his army. That despite the weakness, I will still continue. Give me strength like the mighty men of David. Despite how tired I am, I will still hold on to the sword. Lord, strength to continue. I receive strength to continue. I receive strength to continue. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God, hold me, Lord. Hold me, Lord, through these harsh times. Hold me, Lord, through these dark times. May we shine as light in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. May we remain burning for you as lights on the hill. May we never lose this brilliance that you've given to us. May we never lose anything, Lord. Give us strength to continue. For your word says, he that endures to the end shall be saved. We receive grace to wait, grace to, be, to endure, to be patient in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Can we quickly commit the service of today into God's sense and say, Lord, have your way. Have your way. Teach us your counsel. From the very opening prayers to the end of the service, let it be you that will be seen. Let it be clearly you that will be seen. We ask that it is you that will be seen, that you will be glorified, that you will be exalted. You will be seen, that sicknesses will be healed on this altar today. Burdens will be lifted up today. In the name of Jesus, can you pray? Say, Lord, I desire to hear your voice. Instructions for the next phase of my life. I receive clarity for what I need to do. Can you say, Lord, I receive, I receive, I receive, I receive. How can I come to your presence and go back the same way? Let it be evident to even my physical flesh that I have met with his majesty. Let it be evidence in my life that I have come close enough to you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone.